Europe was on the fast track to cutting carbon emissions, riding high on the green wave. But now the Russia war with Ukraine has exposed giant energy gaps, forcing a shocking turnaround in the green agenda. Any thoughts about Europe's green energy progress? I'm never going to get the targets at the moment. This week, why Europe is putting shuttered coal plants back online ahead of a frigid winter and what the U.S. should learn. To have to reopen those coal mines is an admission of defeat. If you want to go to ground zero for inflation, these fertile fields would be a good start. Issues about whether or not there was going to be enough fertilizer to go around. So we can expect to keep paying higher prices. Yeah. This week, the reasons behind the rising costs of putting food on America's tables. This week, a look at a whiplash summer for home sales. A lot has changed. Oh my God, last time I seen you was a seller's market. Home prices are tanking and homeowners' heads are spinning. We take a look at a twisted and troubling housing recession. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. We begin with an amazing development on the energy front. Right now, some of the world's leaders in green energy are reluctantly returning to fossil fuel in a big way. That's because what some see as a climate emergency has been overtaken by a more immediate crisis, a global energy disaster. Europe is rationing power and on the cusp of shortages and blackouts, worrying about citizens literally freezing over the winter. Today, we travel to the United Kingdom and Germany, where experts say their experience is a warning of what may come here as the U.S. follows in their green energy footsteps. You're looking at an artist's animation of a modern marvel, a massive project now under construction in the North Sea off the northeast coast of England. What role will the Dogger Bank wind farm play? So Dogger Bank Wind Farm is going to be, when it's complete in 2025, um, the world's largest offshore wind farm. It's going to be able to provide um, over 5% of the UK's electricity demand. Alexandra Malone is with SSE Renewables, the company leading construction of the $10 billion project. What you will see when the wind farm is complete is 277 turbines. These are state-of-the-art technology, you know, some of the biggest in the world. They are 260 meters tall, or for an American audience, they are the same height as the tower at the Rockefeller Center in New York. So remarkably big, a blade single rotation will generate enough to power a home for two days. It's all part of a master plan to hasten the death of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. Europe is far ahead of the U.S. in terms of aggressive moves to get to what's called net zero, to add zero pollutants like carbon dioxide from coal plants to the atmosphere. Great Britain's Build Back Greener plan unveiled last year promises to get there by 2050. But on our recent visit to Great Britain, we found clean energy optimism dissolving into doubt. Any thoughts about Europe's green energy progress or the United Kingdom's green energy progress? They want to get to net zero by 2050. Well, obviously, here on bicycles, we're very much big on uh, recycling and net zero and uh, no emissions. We're never going to get there. Never going to get the targets at the moment. The fact is, there's been a fast and remarkable turnaround in Europe's green agenda. They're ramping back up on fossil fuel. Greece, the Netherlands and the Czech Republic have already reopened shuttered coal plants and resumed coal mining where it had been halted. Germany has authorized restarting 27 coal plants. David Cowling of King's College University in London. I think that's a very tangible thing if they are reopening coal plants that may look like failure. Absolutely. And I don't know if there's any way to explain it away, um, because how can you? You know, the coal is regarded as one of the worst polluters. 
and for a country that has been at the forefront of, of wanting to advance the cause of green energy, to have to reopen those coal mines is an admission of defeat. It was a singular event that exposed serious fault lines in Europe's ambitious climate change plans. The war in Ukraine has laid bare poor planning, unrealistic goals, and reliance on an unreliable partner, Russia. Russia was providing half of the European Union's coal and 40% of its gas. Russia has already dramatically cut what it's selling the EU. Now amid soaring energy prices and critically short supplies, Europe has set a target of a 15% reduction in its citizens' gas usage and has warned it's on the cusp of winter rationing and blackouts. France and Spain limited air conditioning in businesses over the summer. Germany has banned heating of pools and warming of offices above 66 degrees. And there have been mass protests over the German government's handling of the mess. Germany has certainly been uh, very active in trying to go, to, to go green. Um, but like a lot of countries that are going green, they still substantially rely upon fossil fuels. You can't suddenly go and change from 100% you know, fossil fuel to 100% green. It doesn't work like that. And whilst there were abundant supplies of traditional fossil fuels and natural gas, people could imagine moving in steady stages uh, towards more green energy. But actually, once you disrupt that system, once you turn off the taps, it brings home very brutally and very quickly how dependent you are. The disaster unfolding in Europe may foreshadow what's to come in the U.S., which is following in Europe's footsteps. Just as Europe was descending into its crisis and scrambling to dial back on clean energy, President Biden was signing the biggest climate change bill ever in the U.S., the Inflation Reduction Act. Now look. The Inflation Reduction Act invests $369 billion to take the most aggressive action ever, 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 ever in confronting the climate crisis and strengthening our, our economic, our energy security. It's baffling to me that the White House is not focusing on this disastrous result and saying, well, they got it wrong, we ought to rethink this. John Constable is author of Europe's Green Experiment. We caught up with him in London. What have we seen or what could the U.S. learn from Europe? Europe is much further ahead. We've spent much more. We've learnt much more. Uh, at least we could have learnt a great deal, and so can you. The experiment has been disastrous, to put it no more strongly. Since around about 2008, we've spent nearly 800 billion U.S. dollars subsidizing renewable energy. The costs have not fallen. We've not got a green industry. All we've done is increase consumer costs, dramatically increase consumer costs. We found similar analysis in Germany, where the ideal of green energy has crashed into reality, according to Professor Alexander Libman. It's very difficult to master this great transition under the conditions of economic crisis and with a population which will fully suffer from possible, um, from possible energy deficit. Uh, there are simply no alternatives for gas supply on the global market Germany and other European countries can rely upon. There is no substitute. So what happens? I don't know. Nobody knows, actually. The hope is that Putin doesn't stop gas supply. It seems like this is maybe then a turning point in a quick march forward in Europe toward climate change policies and green energy. Now is all of that having to be reconfigured? Absolutely. Uh, I think if you talk to somebody who clearly subscribes to the Green Party agenda, they would say that's exactly the moment when one needs to push forward. And that's the moment when the energy transition really has to happen. But I'm not so sure about that. But pushing forward on green energy ever harder is the strategy, supported by politicians like Stella Creasy in London. She's a left-leaning member of the UK Parliament. For many of us, the answer isn't to go back to fossil fuels, it's to put the investment into renewable energy, because that also makes us less reliant on people like Russia and the terrible things that they're doing in the Ukraine and the way they're holding the world to ransom in that way. 
So far, it's still full speed ahead for the Dogger Bank Wind Farm Project, which is scheduled to start producing its first wattage next summer and for a projected lifetime of 35 years. <laughs> Meantime, the UK and other European countries are implementing costly plans to help their citizens pay skyrocketing energy bills, keep the lights on, and heat their homes this winter. It's a $500 billion tab and growing, ultimately billed to taxpayers. People who aren't watching this carefully, but they do like the idea of green energy and they're well-meaning. I'm talking about people in the United States. What is your advice to them? Look carefully at what's happened in Europe and make up your own mind about whether it's been a success. Do you really want to see falling energy consumption, deindustrialization, extremely high consumer prices across the board from industry right the way through to households? If that's what you want, uh, well, by all means, go ahead, copy Europe and its experiment. If, on the other hand, you want to prosper and be a defensible and independent country still, well, think again. How bad is it? Slovakia's prime minister recently declared that skyrocketing electricity costs have put the country's economy at risk of collapse. Next on Full Measure, we are off to the farm to find out how inflation there translates to prices you pay at the grocery. One recent poll finds 92% of Americans consider inflation, rising prices, an important issue in the upcoming midterm elections, outpacing other hot-button issues like abortion and crime. Today, Scott Thuman takes us to the farm to find out how inflation there translates to what you pay at the grocery store. Outside Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Dennis Kohler takes a long look at his crop. His family's been farming in this area since 1789. That we're looking at, right at 1,500 acres, it's a small operation, but Kohler's committed to his farm. This year, though, it's been tougher than most. I think we're in a good place, a bad place. How is it for you? Um, I think we're in an onshore place right now. You don't have control of a lot of what's happening, and, and that makes this a a very hard thing but one thing we have to remember is as a whole farming is typically a tight budget setup the money that gets left behind on the profit line or you know on the plate at, at the end of the day isn't a lot and what's eating away at the budget on this farm and countless others across the country inflation and supply problems Kohler is paying between 50 and 200 percent more for fertilizer than he did just last year providing he can get his hands on it. February, March, April, um, we were hearing a lot of issues about whether or not there was going to be enough fertilizer to go around. Uh, prices started really climbing. Um, there was situations where they were telling us that we might not be able to get it when we needed it. Getting what they need isn't always about seed or machinery. At the Leelanau Fruit Company in Michigan, it's workers that are hard to find. Glenn LaCrosse has been growing cherries for 50 years, and he's been the boss here for nearly three decades. Orchards take a lot of labor, and we're certainly for several years now been short on labor, and that really limits us to be able to contribute to to bear shelves at the, at the store. So he's paying $23 an hour to attract workers. That's seven times higher than what countries like Turkey are paying. So it costs a lot more just to keep the line moving. Inflation, too, taking a toll. But I mean, you were telling me, which made me raise an eyebrow, you were talking about over your shoulder is a lot of sugar. What are yeah. you paying for sugar right now? We're paying about 70 cents a pound for sugar. And I'd say three years ago, we were probably paying in the 22 cent range. Yeah. So sugar has gone up three times. It's tripled. Yeah, yeah. The skyrocketing costs of packaging and transportation adding up as well. While the U.S. inflation rate has hovered around 8%, farmers' costs have risen even higher. Some experts calculate it's costing farmers about 40% more to grow a crop this year compared to two years ago. 
Roger Kryan is the chief economist at the American Farm Bureau. Well, farmers are facing inflation in things like fuel and fertilizer in particular. Uh, fuel prices doubled and fertilizer prices tripled, tripled um, last year as, as, uh, as the economy heated up after COVID. Prices that are well above inflation that everyone else is facing. So the bottom line for farmers is, uh, has been a lot tougher than you would expect. Growing up yeah. here. And the pain, Kohler warns, to be felt for a long time, well beyond when the economy bounces back. Americans will still pay more for what farmers are putting on the table now. In our case, we feed a lot of cattle. And in the case of steer, it takes 18 to 24 months to finish a steer on feed. So potentially, we might not see the total cost effect on beef for maybe a year to two years from now. So we can expect to keep paying higher prices. Yeah, I think uh, unless we see uh, some sort of crash in the economy mm -hmm. that causes the inflation to go down, um, you know, that the currency is devalued, unless we see that, it's, it's a given that it has to keep going up. For American farmers, the only choice to keep working the land and hope for brighter days ahead. I think I might know the answer, but are the farmers making more then? Well, in general, no. Uh, while we're paying a lot more at the grocery store these days, farmers' costs have risen even faster, and many of them are really just trying to hang on. Thanks for the report. When we come back, how shopping for houses changed on a dime. With a possible economic recession on the horizon, there could be big trouble in America's housing market. Buyers and sellers are suffering from whiplash after recent wild swings in home prices and mortgage rates. Lisa Fletcher takes us to one city for the roller coaster ride. We begin our look at the volatile world of home sales in Atlanta at the beginning of the summer. And it's quiet. Our guide on this housing roller coaster ride is real estate agent Kina Stewart. This is a two bedroom, two bath. What I like about this one, look at this space the here. Sunroom, that's this really is nice. gorgeous. On this day in June, the market is red hot. Stewart is showing prospective home buyer Joey Laterman a condo priced at $225,000 and almost certain to sell for much more. We can literally lock the door and walk out and I might get a notification that it's off the market. So they move that fast. Earlier this year in Atlanta and across the nation, mortgage rates were at an historic low of 3%. Average home prices there soared almost 25 percent between 2020 and 2021, and there were more buyers than houses. All that added up to a seller's market, meaning people selling homes like this condo could call the shots and often have multiple buyers bidding up the price. It's just a waiting game, I guess, you know, eventually you'll find something. Home buying experience here in Atlanta is crazy. We have cash buyers competing against cash buyers. People are putting in bids 10 to 30% over list price. Then a big turnaround. Interest rates topped 5% in July, meaning the cost of a home loan nearly doubled compared to a year before. The new report shows home buyers are canceling deals at the highest rate since the start of the pandemic. Emily Making payments on the very same $250,000 home easily $350 a month more. At the same time, inflation has soared and the housing supply has begun to catch up with demand. In July, about 63,000 buyers across the U.S. backed out of sales contracts on houses they could no longer afford. And housing prices started to tumble that same month, notably in Boise, Idaho, where nearly 70 percent of sellers dropped their price. Denver, Salt Lake City and Tacoma among the top metro areas to see discounts. We went back to Atlanta after this seismic shift to find real estate agent Keena Stewart adjusting to the new reality. The market has shifted 
to a buyer's market, like literally overnight. A lot has changed. Oh my God. Last time I seen you, it was a seller's market. This is hot areas are usually overpriced. Yes. So what's happening? On this day, yes. Stewart is showing condos in the trendy yes. Atlantic yes. Station yes. neighborhood. So in these particular buildings, at one particular time, there's about 16 to 20 condos for sale, and they've all dropped their pricing. Stewart's client, Pamela Hill, is looking to downsize. As a buyer, she likes the lower prices, but as a seller, knows she won't be able to get as much money for her current home. If I sell my property today, my challenges that my husband and I are facing is trying to buy something for that same value. I like how it has a pathway through the It's a predicament facing homeowners across the country, including Joey Laterman, the Atlanta client who was looking at the $250,000 condo back in June. That condo sold the next day for almost $35,000 over asking price. And Laterman found himself forced to retreat to the sidelines, dropping the selling price of his own home and putting his buying plans on hold. For Full Measure, I'm Lisa Fletcher. And after a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? President Biden recently visited Puerto Rico, recovering from Hurricane Fiona two and a half weeks ago. He promised the U.S. territory another 60 million tax dollars for infrastructure improvements on top of $2 billion already granted by Congress for the same purpose after Fiona. We have to do more. We have to ensure that when the next hurricane strikes, Puerto Rico is ready. Meantime, Puerto Rico is still spending more than $64 billion committed by Congress after Hurricanes Maria and Irma in 2017. As we've reported, Puerto Rico has struggled to rebuild critical infrastructure in the five years since being hit by the double hurricanes. Maria destroyed the entire power grid, which is now a key part of the taxpayer-backed reconstruction on the island. To date, only about a quarter of those billions have reportedly been spent, and the grid took another big hit during Fiona. One key problem with relief funds to Puerto Rico, which we reported, is persistent corruption. And Puerto Rico's long relationship with corruption continues. In August, former Governor Wanda Vasquez Garced was arrested by the FBI and charged with bribery related to her 2020 campaign. The indictment says the scheme involved the governor accepting more than $300,000 in exchange for appointing a designated person to a political post. A political consultant to Vasquez Garced and the president of a bank have pleaded guilty to taking part. Coming up next week on Full Measure, an FBI special agent at the time refused to take part in FBI SWAT raids of nonviolent suspects from the January 6th pro-Trump Capitol demonstrations and then risked his job to step forward and blow the whistle on the agency's political bias. If the FBI becomes the bully, that doesn't change my responsibility. I need to stand up and, and face that down, even if it means my career. That's next week on Full Measure. Until then, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable.